This morning we're going to be uh, reading a portion of John's Gospel. It just so happens that uh, as we're working our way through John's Gospel, we come to this particular text, which is a part of what we call the Passion Week, that last week of our Lord Jesus Christ here on earth. This particular text has to do with what we call his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So what we want to do is read this text and understand what's, what's going on here and especially why it is that Jesus came into Jerusalem at this Passover feast and of course was to lay down his life so that all who believed in him might be saved. Uh, John chapter 12 beginning in verse 12 I'd like to read through verse 19. On the next day the large crowd who had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus, finding the young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. These things uh, his disciples did not understand at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him, and that he had done these things to him. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify about him. For this reason also the people went and met him because they heard that he had performed this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good? Look, the world has gone after him. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, for those of you who were here uh, previous week when we were looking at John's gospel, last time we were in John's gospel, we saw uh, the king, that is Jesus, being anointed for his burial. Recall that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem for his final Passover. But before he arrived, he stopped in Bethany in order to minister to, in order to serve those whom he loved, uh, Martha and Mary and Lazarus, whom we saw in chapter 11, Jesus had raised from the dead. Jesus came to encourage them. He came to minister to them. He came to comfort them because of what was about to take place. But Jesus also came there in order to allow them to serve him. And that's exactly what they did. They not only prepared a meal for him and sought to take care of his needs, show him hospitality, but Mary showed extraordinary love. She had saved up this, this precious ointment, which was worth 300 days' wages. That's a lot of money, nearly a year's worth of labor to purchase this. And she applied the ointment to his feet and wiped it with her hair. Now, she didn't know at the time, but she was, in fact, as Jesus said, anointing him for burial. These things were going to take place very quickly. Jesus was going to be betrayed. He was going to be uh, condemned. He was going to be scourged and beaten and crucified and, and put into, into the tomb. There wasn't going to be time for this, so the Lord had provided ahead of time that Mary would actually show him this love and this kindness. She was preparing him for that for which he came into the world, to die, which was now just a few days away when he would lay down his life for everyone who ever had believed in the Messiah who was coming or everybody who has believed since he has come. Now he had earlier, Jesus had earlier told his half-brothers, remember Jesus did have brothers, I believe sisters as well, the children of Joseph and Mary that they had after Jesus, who didn't believe in him at this time, they did later. When they were trying to get him to go up to the Feast of Booze, to show himself to be the Messiah. They said in John 7, verse 8, or actually Jesus said to them, go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet fully come. And when we were looking at that passage, we understood Jesus was not saying that he wasn't going to go up to that feast at all because God required that feast of all Jewish men. But what he was saying was he was not going to go up with them he wasn't going to go up publicly because the Jewish leaders were already wanting to kill him. They were watching the roads, hoping to find Jesus outside the city, hoping he would come to the feast so that they could take him outside the city and kill him secretly. They couldn't do it in front of the people because he was much too popular. 
So Jesus didn't want to go publicly. He didn't want to go openly. He went up to the feast secretly. Even if these Jews had wanted to take him, of course they couldn't because it was not yet Jesus' time to die. John writes in verse 30 of that same chapter, So they were seeking to seize him, and no man laid his hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And in chapter 8, verse 20, These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. You see, it wasn't yet time for Jesus to die, to lay down his life. But the point now is that time had come. This Passover was going to be the last one Jesus would celebrate on earth because at this one he would die. No one takes his life from him, but he lays it down willingly. Now, I don't have to tell you that Easter is that time of the year when our attention is drawn to these, to these events. When we remember the Passion Week, a whole series of events that took place in the last week of his life on earth. Beginning with his entrance into Jerusalem, his last supper with his disciples, his betrayal, his, his death, his, particularly his being buried and being raised again from the dead to life. It's the time when we remember what Jesus did to save those of us who have put our trust in him and everybody who will from what we justly deserve and to give to us that life, which of course we don't deserve, that life which has no end, that life in a heaven that the Lord describes as a paradise of perfect love and blessing, purely as a free gift of His grace, not something that we earn, not something we have to work for. You don't do so many good works and then God says, here, I'm going to reward you with eternal life. No, Jesus does it all. He obeys God perfectly. And then he offers it to us as a free gift. Jesus was going to wrap up his entire ministry in this week. Now this morning we're going to focus on his entrance into Jerusalem. Again, because that's where we're at in our study of John's gospel. This evening we're going to consider the resurrection and why it is that it's important. But I do want us to see that his entrance into Jerusalem is also important. Everything that Jesus did was important. Everything he did was another step towards accomplishing salvation for all who believe. So I want us to see three things from this passage. I want us to see, first of all, the king's presentation. Jesus is presented to Israel as your king. I want us to see the king's purpose, that it wasn't what the Jews thought he had come for, but it was for something far more important. And then lastly, I want us to see the response of the king's disciples. They didn't understand what he was doing, but they would. So first of all, let's consider the king's presentation. Again, John writes in our text in verses 12 and 13. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Now John tells us that a large crowd went out to meet Jesus. There were many Jews who were present in Jerusalem because of the Passover. It was one of the three required feasts that all Jewish men had to attend. And so they had come from really all different quarters of the Roman Empire to attend this feast. And many of the women also came because they wanted to celebrate what the Lord had done for their forefathers in Egypt when he had delivered them out of Egypt. Remember, the Passover commemorates the final plague that God had inflicted on Egypt that took the lives of all the firstborn of Egypt, the the plague that finally compelled Pharaoh to let Israel go, and, and that's when Israel left. God delivered them. He redeemed them out of Egypt. But remember, before God brought that judgment, he promised that he would spare his own people if they would take a lamb and sacrifice that lamb and take the blood and put it on the doorposts and the lintels of their houses. That sacrificial lamb was pointing to the Lord Jesus. It was a picture of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, whose blood would cause God's judgment to pass over all who would believe in him, even as the angel of death passed over those houses where the lamb's blood was applied. It was, again, a picture of God's grace and His mercy for all who will trust 
in the Messiah. Now what better time could there have been for Jesus to present himself to Israel? Most of the Jews were there from all over the Roman Empire and they were celebrating a feast that was pointing specifically to him. This was the perfect time. And again, it was a part of God's plan. You know, it's almost surprising to see how many Jews actually came out to greet Jesus and, of course, the way in which they greeted him, especially when you consider how many times John has already told us that the Jewish leaders at Jerusalem and many of the Jews wanted to kill Jesus. That's the reason why he kept avoiding Jerusalem and the reason why his disciples kept warning him to avoid Jerusalem because they wanted to kill him. So why all these Jews now coming out to meet him? Why the excitement? What changed? Well, we need to remember that not all the Jews rejected Jesus. The leaders and some of the Jews did, and that certainly made it dangerous in Jerusalem, but there were many who were inclined to believe Jesus. There were Jews that had come from all over the Roman Empire to this feast who had never seen Jesus but had heard about him and wanted to see him and some of them were already inclined to believe but John also tells us that there were many who came out to meet Jesus who had seen what Jesus had just recently done raised a man from the dead Lazarus there were also many who came out to meet him uh, who had heard from these people who had seen what Jesus did when he raised Lazarus and they believed and so they went out to meet him. John writes in verses 17 and 18 in our text. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify about him. For this reason also the people went and met him because they heard that he had performed this sign. It, it almost sounds like what John is saying here is that the majority of the people that came out to meet Jesus were there because of the testimony of those who had seen what Jesus did with regard to Lazarus. They either saw it or they heard from somebody who did. I just want to pause here for a moment and encourage each one of us to remind us of how powerful a personal testimony, a personal witness can be. Somebody who is excited about the truth, somebody who's convinced of the truth and who tells other people. Now, you and I may not have seen this miracle of Lazarus. We may not have seen the miracles that the Bible speaks about with our own eyes. But we have read it from Scripture. And the Scripture gives to us an eyewitness testimony of those who actually did see these miracles. We also have the testimony, as I've said before, really of the Bible as a whole, if we were to be able to take time to do this and look at the, the prophecies to look at the predictions that were made hundreds and thousands of years before they actually came, uh, came and well, actually took place, uh, predicting with, with, well, incredible accuracy what was going to take place. We have those things. We also have natural revelation, the fact that we couldn't be here except there were an all-powerful God of supreme intelligence and wisdom who could make such a thing. But we also have a, another testimony, and that is the testimony of our lives. If we are believers here this morning, God has actually raised us to life as we saw in the case of Lazarus. He was physically dead and God raised him to life. We were spiritually dead and God raised us to life and he changed us. He changed our character supernaturally by his grace. And that one mark that shows that we've been born again of God is that ability he gives to us to love Jesus to love his people, to love his word, and to walk in his ways. Now, Jesus actually tells us that this is the most powerful testimony that we can possibly show someone, that we can possibly give to someone else. Jesus says in John 13, verse 35, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, the ability to again, uh, love the Lord, to love his people, and even to love our enemies is something that we cannot do by nature, but it's something that God must do within us. And when we are able to do that, it is a testimony like this other testimony that motivates people to seek the Lord and to believe in him. Now, John tells us that those who had come out to see Jesus had also brought palm branches with them 
Now, we know that God doesn't waste any words uh, in, in His Word. He doesn't fill the Bible with unnecessary details. So what is it that the Lord wanted us to see right here? Well, we know that uh, there were many palm trees that were growing in that area. As a matter of fact, on the Mount of Olives on one side, uh, we know from, from Israel today as well as uh, the, exa- or the, the accounts we have of Israel in the past, on one side of the Mount of Olives there were many, surprisingly, olive trees from which the Mount of Olives actually got its name. But on the southern side of that mountain, also where Bethany was, there were many palm trees growing. And since Bethany and the Mount of Olives was close to Jerusalem, there were many palm branches near at hand. But why bring palm branches out to meet Jesus at all? Why did they bring them? Well, John Gill tells us that to the Jewish mind, the palm tree was a symbol of joy and victory. Those who carried these branches out to meet Jesus were rejoicing. They were rejoicing specifically that their king, the promised Messiah, had finally come to the city of David to sit on his throne. Now, we know that this is what they were thinking. It's clear from what they were quoting, the Messianic Psalm that talks about the coming of the Messiah. Psalm 118, verse 26. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. And basically what this means is they recognize that the one that they had waited for, the one they had prayed for, the one they had been longing for for so long, the son that God had promised to David, whose throne he would establish forever, the one who was going to save them in their minds from the tyranny of Rome was finally here. This was a time to rejoice. In other words, the Jews saw Jesus as their promised Messiah, the one who was coming to overthrow the Romans and to set them free from the Romans. So they were very happy. Now, second, this is where we actually come to why Jesus actually did come. We see the king's purpose. Now, I just mentioned that these Jews expected Messiah was going to lead them to victory over the Romans. They weren't right about this. That wasn't why Jesus came. Why did he come? Why was he riding into Jerusalem at this time, this feast? What was his purpose? Well, he came to save them from a tyrant, but it was a different tyrant than the Roman tyrant. And it was one that was much more dangerous because its consequences are much more dangerous, much more deadly, and that is sin. Rome can only kill the body. That's the worst that Rome can do to you. But sin can destroy the soul. Now, they didn't realize it, I think, at this time. I think it's clear John tells us. Even the disciples didn't realize it. But the psalm that they were shouting, as well as the animal on which Jesus was riding, were both meant to point them to the fact that Jesus was there to vanquish the tyrant or the tyranny of sin. In verse 13, the crowd was shouting out, Hosanna, which is another quote from Psalm 118, In verse 25, the word basically means, save now, we beg you. You know, we often think of the word Hosanna as like, praise God, you know, kind of like hallelujah, but Hosanna actually means, save us, we beg you, save us now. Well, that's exactly what Psalm 118, verse 25 says. O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Well, that's exactly what Jesus was there to do, but not in the way they thought. What is it that had to happen in order for Jesus to bring this? Well, the psalm actually addresses that as well in the previous few verses and the verses we use for our call to worship. In Psalm 118, verses 22 through 24, this is how he would save. This is how he would bring prosperity. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So how was Jesus going to save? How was he going to bring uh, prosperity? Well, Jesus, first of all, would have to be rejected by Israel's leaders. He would be crucified. He'd be cast out. And then he would be raised again from the dead. And that, as we see from this text, 
would be the day in which our Lord becomes the chief cornerstone of this church, that which is the foundation of this church. Without Jesus, there is no church because there's no redeemed. He has to die. He has to be raised again from the dead in order to save us from our sins. Now, we see that in the word Hosanna, and we see that in these references to Psalm 118, but interestingly enough, we also see it in the way that Jesus actually chose to enter into Jerusalem. The animal that he chose to ride on which was a donkey. Now, John writes this in verses 14 and 15. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it. As it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Now again, why was Jesus riding a donkey? Well, he was doing it for at least three reasons. There's probably more. But he did it, first of all, to fulfill this prophecy. Right? Because this is what the Lord said would happen when Messiah came. He would enter into Jerusalem riding a donkey in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Again, spoken many years before this took place. The prophet says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He came in on a donkey to fulfill prophecy. Secondly, he did this to express humility. We just read what Zechariah said. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey. Uh, those of you who know a little bit about the history of the kings of Israel know that God commanded the kings of Israel never to multiply horses to themselves. And the reason was because horses are powerful animals. Horses give an advantage in a battle. If you have a horse, you're, you're more likely to win, at least humanly speaking. But if you have a horse, you're also more likely to trust that horse to win the battle for you rather than to trust the Lord. So the Lord said, I don't want you to have any horses. I don't want you to have any chariots. I want you to trust me. So what did the kings ride instead of horses? Well, they, read, uh, they, they rode on the backs of donkeys. You know, we, we, we get this, this picture in our minds of what a conquering king looks like, right? Somebody who's powerful, maybe has some powerful weapons, and he's mounted on the back of this powerful horse. Well, that's not what the kings of Israel look like. They were humble uh, when they were doing what they should be doing and they were riding on the back of these humble animals. When the king of Judah was anointed, he would always ride a donkey to the ceremony. So this, I, this fact that Jesus rode this donkey also showed his humility. But thirdly, there's another possible reason that Jesus came on the back of this particular animal, and it's one that we don't often think about because, well, it probably hasn't been pointed out to us, but donkeys were often used to make covenants, to make covenants in the ancient Near East. If two men wanted to make a covenant, they would, they would take an animal, not uncommonly a donkey, maybe because donkeys were cheaper and not you know, as valuable as horses, and they would cut the animal in, into two pieces, which sounds rather uh, gross, but what it means is, of course, there's a dead animal here and there's blood that's spilled. And the two parties would walk between the two pieces of the animal as they're making this covenant as a declaration that if either of them broke that covenant, then it should be done to them as was done to this animal. If I break this covenant, may I be cut in two, just like this donkey. Now, obviously, what was at stake had to be important enough, had to be serious enough to warrant the death penalty if the covenant was broken. But if it did... This is how they would make the covenant. When the Lord made his covenant with, with Abraham, he had Abraham take several animals and cut them into two pieces, preparing to walk through the pieces with the Lord. And so uh, Abraham did that, and he waited for the Lord. But when it finally came time for the covenant to be made, the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Abraham, and the Lord walked through the pieces by himself, and he swore the oath himself and took the obligation on himself to bring the blessings of his covenant to Abraham and to his children. In other words, it was not going to depend upon Abraham and what he did, but it was going to depend upon what the Lord did. And now we see the Lord 
The same Lord who made this covenant with Abraham, the same Lord who walked through the pieces that, of the animals that Abraham had killed, we see him coming into Jerusalem in our nature on the back of this donkey to fulfill the promise that he had made with Abraham to bless and to multiply his children as the sand of the sea or as the stars in the heaven, not the physical children of Abraham, but his spiritual children, those who believe like Abraham. Jesus came to save his people, everyone who would put their trust in him. Jesus was coming to fulfill that covenant by offering himself as a sacrifice for sin so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So that's why Jesus came into Jerusalem, you know, riding uh, this donkey and why the people were chanting, as it were, Hosanna, save now, we beg you, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, was because Jesus was coming to fulfill the obligations of the covenant. He had completed his obedience. It was time to offer now a sacrifice and atonement. Now, there's a lot that happened after this, and obviously the rest of the Gospel of John is going to be taken up in that what Jesus had to do in order to bring down the blessings of the covenant, the blessings of salvation. And we're not going to have time to look at those things this morning, but let me just give you a brief sketch and then conclude with an applicational point. Jesus was going to allow himself to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He was going to be put on trial and found guilty. Even though he committed no sin, nor any deceit was found in his mouth, he was going to be rejected he was going to be found guilty. He was going to be handed over to the Romans to be mocked and scourged. He was going to be crucified, nailed to a cross between two criminals. He would suffer God's full wrath on the cross for the sins of all who would put their faith in him. And when he had suffered enough, he would willingly give up his spirit and die. He would be buried, remain in the tomb for three days, and then on the third day, he would rise again from the dead. After showing himself to his disciples over a period of several days, 40 days, and to over 500 at one time, as we've just read, he would ascend into heaven in the sight of his disciples, sit down at the right hand of God and take up his rule over all creation until he comes at the end of the world to judge all mankind. Now again, Jesus did all of these things so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. So here is the king's presentation. Here is the king's purpose. Now finally, I want us to see the response of the king's disciples because I think this is very, very important for us to see. Now we ask ourselves the question as we do as the disciples are following Jesus around, being taught by Jesus, did they understand all of this? Did they even know what was going on? Well, surprisingly, after having been with Jesus for three and a half years, they still didn't seem to know. After having heard him teach on the subject so many times, they still didn't seem to have a clue, but they would shortly. Uh, John writes this in verse 16. These things, the things we just read about, his entry and what people were saying, these things his disciples did not understand at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. Now when Jesus was betrayed, when he was condemned, when he was crucified, the disciples, if you read a little bit later in the Gospels, also thought God's plan had failed. They were still thinking like the rest of the Jews. Jesus didn't come to do anything else but to overthrow the Romans. That's what the Messiah was supposed to do. Throw off the, the yoke of tyranny, set us free. They wouldn't understand what Jesus really came to do until Jesus was glorified, until sitting at the right hand of God, he would pour out of his Holy Spirit upon them. And when that happened, they would finally begin to see what Jesus had actually done for them. 
Now again, this shows us that there is an involvement on the part of God, isn't there, as far as what we're able to see and what we're not able to see and how we respond to the things we've just read. We need God's Spirit, don't we, in order to understand these things. And so the question, the applicational question I would ask this morning is this. Do you understand? Do you see? Do you see what Jesus has done here? Do you know that what he has done, he's done to save sinners? Do you believe that he is the Messiah? The King of Israel, as, as they were calling out, that certainly was true regarding him. Do you believe that he is the Savior of the world? That he laid his life down willingly? That he was buried? That he was in the tomb for three days? That he rose again to life to save everyone who would trust in him? Do you believe that Jesus ascended into heaven and that he is there right now bodily at the right hand of God ruling the world? basically in sovereign control over the things that are going on? And do you believe that one day he's going to come again to judge everyone who has ever lived according to what they have done? Well, if you believe these things, have you trusted Jesus to save you from your sins? You do need to realize, I, I didn't mention it, but I hope you realize, God didn't provide many ways of salvation. He only provided one, that's Jesus. He wasn't going to put his son through this misery of having grown up in our nature and having lived around sinful people and then suffering his wrath on the cross. He wouldn't have put his son through all of that if he was going to allow people to come any way they please and just kind of bypass Jesus. It would have been cruel for him to do that. No, this is the only way. Do you believe that? Do you believe he's the only way and have you trusted him as the only way? Are you turning from your sins every single day and following Jesus because you want to do that, because you love Jesus? Are you following his example of how he loved and how he served his father and his fellow men? Well, if you are, if you do believe, if you have trusted him, if you are turning from your sins and following him because you do love him, then the Lord has had mercy on you. He has given you his Holy Spirit. You've trusted Jesus. You're safe. You're not going to end up in being punished for your sins in hell forever. You, you're going to go to heaven. Now, if you haven't believed Jesus, I want you to listen to this because this is the gospel. And of course, it's the gospel to those who actually understand, see their need of Jesus Christ. You need to understand that God didn't do all this for nothing. He didn't write this all down in a book and, and share it with us for nothing. He did this because he is offering this salvation to each one of us, to each one of you, even if you haven't received him. As a matter of fact, Jesus freely invites you to come to him this morning. And he says that if you will come to him and trust him, that he will save you. You know, the Lord tells us in his word that, that everyone who comes to him, he will never turn away. He's not going to rebuff you. He's not going to stop you. He's not going to say you're not good enough. None of us are good enough. We're never good enough. That's why Jesus had to obey. That's why he had to die. He offers salvation to whoever will come to him and simply trust him, simply take him in his word, simply reach out and receive him. And the question is, will you receive him? He offers himself to you freely. Will you take hold of him? Will you trust him? He won't turn you away. Come to him and be safe. He calls you to come to him in faith. You know, one of the thieves that he was crucified between on the cross, even though they both started that time, as I imagine, they're in a great deal of pain. Uh, they had been nailed to a cross. That, that, that hurts. They're dying. And they were cursing at Jesus. But at some point, one of the thieves has a change of heart. And he looks over to Jesus and he asks Jesus, Lord, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked at him. He didn't, he didn't reprove him. He didn't reject him. He didn't say, well, you've lived a life of sin your whole life. You're going to die in misery and, and go to hell. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus says in Luke 23, 43, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Now what did the thief who was on the cross do to deserve that? Nothing. Nothing. 
He simply looked to Jesus and asked for his mercy. And when he did, Jesus granted it to him freely. If you want the mercy and grace that Jesus offers to you, all you have to do is come to him in faith and simply ask him. If you want to be with him in heaven, if you want to be in that place of perfect love and perfect blessing, if you don't want to suffer for an eternity in hell for your sins, all you need to do is believe what Jesus is telling you here this morning. All you need to do is accept him at his offer. All you need to do is look to him and say, Lord, remember me. And that's exactly what he will do. Jesus is here for you this morning. Reach out and receive him. He invites you to come. Well, let's, let's bow for just a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord. You know, if, if we know the Lord, let's thank Him for His mercy. But if we don't, then may the Lord give you grace by His Holy Spirit to accept His offer and to look to Him in faith. Let, let's just spend a few moments in silent prayer.